So um, I guess I, I should probably answer the question about uh, demilitarizing the police or defunding the police. Um, so I think that what we, what I think, the, what the way in which I think we should understand the police should it be, should it be an institution which, uh, which, uh, for which their power is being misused or mishandled, so that we have the unfortunate situation where uh, working class people poorer people, uh, minoritized ethnic groups are being uh, targeted by policing because this is some kind of, um, uh, there's been an unfortunate and pre potentially preventable mishap in the way in which policing functions. I, don't th I think we should also um, avoid thinking about policing um, as uh, not functioning properly in as far as we've had um, as a massive expansion expansion in our prison systems, a massive, massive expansion in the number of police officers on our streets since the 1970s, um, a massive in expansion of police powers and weaponry from tasers to the power to impose injunctions to surveillance technologies, all of these types of things. I don't think we should consider those things to be an, an aberration through which if we make the necessary reforms uh, we can move to some kind of ideal of the police where they're uh, the local community body um, who uh, gives you a clip around the end for scrumping apples and uh, helps, cap helps caps out of a tree. I think instead what we should be thinking about is a different vision where uh, the police aren't um, the uh, primary authority which uh, we use to improve public safety or reduce um, harm. And I think we can do that by thinking about the police in the same way that we think about the military. So rather than thinking to ourselves, right, how can we make NATO better? Right? How can we make the US Army better? How about, how can, how can NATO be better um, equipped to deal with humanitarian crises in different parts of the world? Instead, what we need to be thinking about is how can we not use NATO? How can we actually avoid and erode the power of NATO and find other ways to deal with humanitarian crises that exist in other parts of the world? And I think we should be thinking of, and along similar lines when it comes to policing in prisons. Rather than simply reforming the police into some kind of ideal, I think we should ex instead identify the fact that the primary function of the police is to reproduce state violence, is to uh, perform forms of punishment um, uh, towards, mem um, towards members of society. And therefore, we should identify different ways of addressing these kinds of problems. So. Um, I've, I've talked about this before, but I'll, maybe I'll talk about it a little bit. So, uh, whether it, so if we think about the, the reasons of a lot of people in prison, whether it be the fact that a lot of people in, in, who are in prison are, don't have access to decent housing, a lot of them have experienced homelessness, a lot of them um, haven't had a good education in school and they've experienced school exclusion, a lot of them have um, uh, experienced domestic violence or child abuse, a lot of people have, ex um, have special educational needs and therefore been neglected and underserved by the school system. A lot of them have had precarious um, um, employment status or precarious um, uh, uh, legal status as, in terms of their citizenship. There are lots of different things that we can do in order to ameliorate the existing injustices within our society that don't rely on the police to try to address those social problems, even if it's I'm going to end by maybe making a very, very quick example of uh, which I always use when I, when I speak to my students. Um, so, what the example I always use is um, if, you're, um, if you're suspected of carrying a gun in Tottenham, um, you can expect to be stopped by the police. Um, you'll probably be arrested. In fact, you, they might even kill you without asking any questions. But if you sell F 16s to Saudi Arabia or cluster bombs to Israel, you'll probably get an OBE. Right? Um, we, we know this. Um, if you um, are, if you if you're caught uh, smoking a, uh, smoking cannabis on Tottenham High Road or in, in Brixton, you can expect to be uh, stopped and searched by the police. Um, but if you sell uh, alcohol, cigarettes, or um, antidepressants, you're a pillar of British industry. Right? Um, there, there are there are children, there are there are mothers who are serving custodial sentences as we speak for uh, handling goods which were taken during the 2011 riots, right? But if you invade Iraq, um, cancel all the oil contracts, right? your oil contracts and work your oil companies and kill a million odd people in the process, you make the Middle East people, right? What does this tell us? This tells us that, um, that the legal system, the criminal justice system, Race. And so even if we got to this ideal where every single police officer was free of corruption, free of racism, free of 
bias, um, uh, following all of the rules and we you know, and, and wanting to, to for every fun of their be come to people's aid. Simply by enforcing the laws as they exist, they would continue to reproduce racism, continue to reproduce the oppression of working class people, and continue to provide a cover against the people in positions of power who are producing far more, uh, greater levels of violence and harm. So yeah, maybe um, let me build on, on what Adam was saying. Um, uh, I, I agree with everything that Adam was saying. Um, but, but I think we, we can say a bit more about some of these things. So, um, and, and Ibtahal, you, you kind of introduced this, sesh, this section by talking about the debate on um, kind of reform versus abolitionism, right? Which is, a, which is an ongoing debate that, that people are having around, around how to think about policing. Um, and, and so there's a couple of things to say about about this, I think, for me. Um, so one is, um, uh, you know, to, to that, that debate between reform and abolitionism is is less stark in in practice than it is in theory, right? So, so in practice, um, uh, w you know, the the kinds of abolitionist politics that exist in the United States. Um, uh, the, the difference between them and people who are who are advocating reform is a difference of the broader kind of political horizon and analysis with which they they think about the criminal justice system um, or even whether they call it that. Um, but in terms of the kinds of demands that they might make, um, there's often much more overlap than um, than you might expect, right? So so abolitionists are not saying the only thing we can do right now is somehow fight for what seems like a a, um, a, a an outcome that is not imminent, which is the complete abolition of, of prisons and police. Um, they're, they're saying, you know, we need to head in that direction, um, and, and there's ch and there's smaller scale changes that we can make right now, and that are achievable right now. Um, uh, uh, so, for example, um, you know, the, the 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 call to defund the police is 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 a kind of reform along those lines, right? It's about in the United States, is about saying, you know. The, budget for um, criminalization is, is is so bloated that it needs to be reduced. That might be a reformist way of thinking about it, but it can also be understood in an abolitionist way, right? Um, now, when we, when we have this debate in the UK context, to some extent, what we're doing is transplanting a particular history and a particular analysis from the United States to the UK, right? Um, and, and when you move from one context to another, some of the um, the translation involved in that process is is going to be a question, right? And so, um, I'm not saying that um, you know that these these problems that have been identified in the United States around policing don't exist in the UK. I'm saying they have a different history in the UK that we often um, miss if we um, uh, simply import um, kind of off the shelf an analysis that's come from the United States. But the, the basic principles of abolitionist politics in the United States for me are valid for the UK as well. But the particular ways in which we might think of how that plays out in the UK would be um, different. Um, so for example, um, in the United States, one of the abolitionist demands, as, as we've said, is um, let's move resources from um, police departments to um, providing uh, resources in the community around caring, right? So move from violence to care, right? Um, now in the UK, that's more complicated. And here's why, because in the UK, we've already got a history of um, uh, local authorities um, running social services departments, youth services departments, um, education, so forth, that um, are better funded than they are in the US, but have already been, um, co-opted by police right so so simply putting more money into um, into those parts of local government for example um, and moving that money away from police departments doesn't actually um, address the key issue which is that um, you know that youth services to the extent they still exist uh, uh, have been co-opted to being the eyes and ears of police um, forces that that you know through things like prevent through things like um, tackling gangs, multi-agency partnerships, these other non-policing agencies have already been turned into quasi-policing agencies. So unless we also address that, which is not at all a similar problem in the United States, right? Unless we address that, we're, we're kind of um, not 
uh, moving forward, right? Which is how this connects to things like the issues of prevent. We need to abolish prevent. We need to abolish gangs, databases. You know, these are these are kind of practical goals, achievable goals that we can we can imagine being possible in the imminent future. They're not utopian. Um, that can be understood as part of an abolitionist politics, right? But in a very specific UK context. Um, uh, we also need to understand the particular history in the UK, right? So, and, th and this is why, um, you know, the, if we look at the history of, of UK, there is a long history of, um, so firstly, you know, policing in the UK, as we've said, already comes out of a particular history of colonialism, comes out of a particular history of defending um, private property of the rich. Um, and um, when movements have emerged over the course of, um, you know, more than 100 years to, to try and challenge the power of the police, to hold it accountable, those movements have always ended up in a situation where um, uh, the, um, you know, we get some kind of local body that's meant to provide some kind of accountability to communities, but never really does, right? Whether it's the local police consultative committees, whether it's the um, you know, the Police Complaints Commission, which then became the Independent Police Complaints Commission, which has now been renamed, doesn't matter what it's called, it's always been a, uh, the police investigating themselves and therefore never really has any teeth, right? So the, um, you know, there's never, uh, since 1969, you know, there's never been a police officer that's been convicted for, um, for the deaths in police custody. Um, you know, so, so, you know, there's, there's no mechanisms of accountability, despite the huge efforts that people have made over the years to, um, find some way of holding the police accountable, right? So the, you know, the, the question that was about, um, you know, can we make the police the kind of people who go out and help us? People have been trying to find all kinds of ways to achieve that. And it's certainly not about going back to the past. There's no golden age when that happened. Um, you know, people have been trying to find all kinds of ways to make the police accountable, but none have been found. And so we do need to do more radical things than, than finding, you know, ways that, um, uh, you know, the, 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 you know, consultative committees, um, complaints commissions, all those kind of tried and tested methods have all failed, right? What I would say is, it, you know, there, there are some practical things we can do. Uh, so, you know, the, the, the gangs database, the prevent database, these kinds of things I already mentioned. Um, we need to um, abolish stop and search, right? It's a, it's a tool that doesn't um, do what it claims to do. Um, uh, it's just simply an institutionalized form of racism. Um, it gives it gives police a power they don't need um we need to have an automatic investigation of police officers who kill people followed up by effective prosecution because that's the only thing that's going to reduce that particular issue um and and then more broadly we need to move to um uh conflict resolution models for dealing with gangs independently of the police and not as part of some kind of community surveillance project but actually independent conflict resolution we need to treat drugs as a public health problem not as a, cr a criminal problem um, we need to have a clear and effective strategy for meeting the social needs of housing and unemployment we need to address child poverty we need to restore independent youth service right that's kind of been abandoned over the last uh, 10 to 20 years um, if we do those things, we can, you know, to me, we're heading in an abolitionist direction, but all of those things are not easily attainable, but it seems to me they're within the realm of the, of the politically possible. Maybe I'll just talk a little bit about what Arun and Adam have already spoken about and just uh, give my two cents thinking about, you know, thinking about here and also thinking about uh, in terms of what's happening in South Asia at the moment, as we are talking here about abolitionist movement, about reform, uh, there are messages being passed uh, between Kashmiris and between, you know, Indians and Pakistanis at the moment because the war is probably imminent, some kind of war. We don't know if it's with China, India and China, India and Pakistan, but there are people asking to stock up rations. So to have this kind of a conversation at that particular moment and thinking about defunding the police and all of that, it's, uh, it's really you know, generative and it's also very fascinating to me to be thinking on these two terms. On one hand, uh, what we see happening back in Kashmir or back in India, so to speak, as well, is the militarization of police. And that is, that is a chronic thing. And uh, some years back, here in Greeley, where I am at the current moment, I had, a, uh, I had this uh, uh, you know, just next, my next door neighbor, it was a small, very, very small uh, drug deal gone bad where a 17 year old and a 21 year old 
they had gone to uh, get their money back from this woman who was trying to get off drugs. And that day I felt like Kashmir had come to uh, US. And what actually happened was we, there was, um, uh, that there was a uh, there was a sh uh, you know the police set up camp in my bedroom, and they had the snipers and everything. They set up up on the dressers and everything. And then uh, looking into this next uh, door neighbor's house, they actually lobbed grenades, and we were back home. Uh, we, we were we were actually out of homes the entire neighborhood. And that night when I came back, 72 grenades or maybe 45, I don't know, uh, they had been lobbed, the smoke uh, grenades had been lobbed into that house uh, just to smoke out two young boys. And uh, when I left my home, I saw this huge Casper looking like armored truck. Uh, it, was, it was the police, the Greeley police. Uh, Greeley is, is really the backwaters. It's an agricultural town. And uh, it was the Greeley police. Uh, and this, this young policeman, I had, he was a young boy, probably a UNC student as well. And he was sweating. And he was in my bedroom and he was the sniper. And there was a young uh, female police officer with him. And the next day I made a wrong turn around the university and someone stops me. It's actually the same a policeman who was in my bedroom as the sniper. So it kind of like started dawning on me at that, from that day. It, and of course, like with the controversies around police, I was, I, I kind of started thinking about like, thinking about the arms and ammunitions and the way these people are loaded and to smoke out a 17 year old and a 21 year old. Uh, this whole house was, there was a big hole in the middle. It was really demolished in a way. Uh, it was almost like the spectacle of militaristic violence that they needed to be uh, uh, putting up the show because uh, they had these arms and armaments and they needed to be put to use. I mean, otherwise you don't need so many uh, grenades and you don't need smoke grenades to smoke out too. And then they were saying that they were holding people hostages it was like, where are your negotiating powers? These are just two young men. We know that they are armed or may that maybe they're not armed, but you have got to use other diplomatic tools. It took a day. And I think, and then uh, when I kind of like talked to my neighbors and talked to some of the other people who were around this incident, it seemed like they were pretty okay with what had happened. It seemed like uh, uh, the neighborhood was not gentrified at that time, but it kind of continued to be gentrified soon after. Uh, there were gates that were put on, barricades that were put on, and when you when this conversation was had with this people, with these people, and the neighborhood uh, kind of came together, it was almost as if everyone was on the same page with the things that were done that day. There was hardly anyone that thought that this was a massive, disproportionate, indiscriminate use of force against two young men who probably had just gone to recover their money from a woman who was get, trying to get off drugs. So when thinking about these situations, these, these, these look like social crimes that are criminalized to such an extent. And that's the moment where I think when, um, when you hear defund the police, uh, I, I feel like for people, the ones who I came across that day and even after who were pretty okay with what had happened, the process that police had adopted. I feel like the message needs to get out to them very clear that defund doesn't mean that you will not have several policemen with arms kind of patrolling every now and then, but it also means shifting your priorities. It means shifting your priorities to probably better negotiating with those boys. It means shifting your priorities to better uh, re rehabilitating that woman who I heard uh, for one year trying to rehabilitate her life across the fence. I, I tried to give her mint one day because I was growing a lot of mint and I was trying to make connection with her, but, but she was in her own world because she was not able to get out of the, the spot she was in because uh, a life of a drug addict, it's, it's criminalized to such an extent that not, not a lot of people want to hobnob with you. They don't want to bring you to your barbecue parties. They don't want you to bring you to your backyard party. So, you're, so I, I feel like that message needs to get across that when we say defund the police, what we actually mean and how that's going to happen. And also it's not the neighborhood watch kind of a model where people are really belligerent and they're looking, uh, there is, that they're, they're woven with racist and woven with all kinds of classist, classist uh, situations. But 
that's really something that we are, uh, you, you know, looking at, uh, thinking more about uh, care, care. But and then I also realized that when we kind of start these situations, it also becomes that suddenly these uh, these people that we are the, the community uh, coming together to put these processes into order. I feel like they also can become stringent in some manners and they also can gather that kind of a power which uh, should not be held by a certain group of people. So that's, a, that's something that we need to kind of watch out for. Uh, so going back to thinking about defunding the police, I feel like that's a great message, but it also needs to be said what we actually mean by that. And I know that there's a long list but many people do not get the message when they when you talk to them about defunding they think it's almost like you know we're asking some kind of anarchy to descend on a community uh, but that's not it it's actually shifting of priorities and that's that that's a message and the other thing so that's 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 kind of talking about here but then also thinking about kashmir and thinking about situations like kashmir how do you think about reform and abolition in a situation where uh, the problems are becoming more acute day by day in 1989, Kashmir had 18,000 policemen. Today, they have 100,000. And no other, um, no other department is getting more recruits than the police. And it's not just the police. It's the other, uh, other allied forms of policing, militia. It's, it's counter-insurgents in different shapes and forms. And it's, it's also the unidentified assailants. Uh, they're also part of that uh, big group. So what do we do in those situations? How, how, how do we take this kind of a message to those people? Especially uh, with laws like uh, that, the laws that are put into or imposed on Kashmir, which is a very draconian law where uh, when there is an administrative failure, you give the entire powers to the military, which is why Kashmir is a de facto military occupation under the Armed Forces Special Powers Act. So no one is accountable. Uh, there is actually a book in India, which is, um, I think it's, um, it's by a journalist who has documented uh, these encounters that happen. And there is a blanket name for those encounters called fake encounters, which people know that these are fake. These people are being killed under fake um, kind of crossfires and they're, uh, they're alleged to be this and that, but they're not. They're just regular civilians who are killed. And this book, uh, is in the bookshops and people read it. And then people also read about these encounters that happen day in and day out across India, but then it also happens focusedly. Because what India is doing, or the powers like India are doing, thinking about Israel as well, is necropolitics. How do we translate the idea of uh, abolitionism and reform into those kind of situations? So if, until and unless we don't go to the root of the problem and then kind of work our way out. And thanks. I was just going to uh, say something about maybe uh, the question of abolition versus reform in the context of immigration um, control, which is sort of what I'd focused on um, speaking about in the first session. Um, and I think it's it's been really um, great to sort of see in the wake of the Black Lives Matter uprising is is talk around abolition that's that's not only been applied to police and defunding police, but also connecting um the criminal justice system with the um with with deportation and questions around immigration and also calls to um to yeah to abolish borders and, and what that might look like and what that might entail and so i suppose i was just going to say that um you know if we think about some of the ways in which borders and um, border violence intersects with the criminal justice system you know some of the examples that adam was talking about about the the, the sorts of crimes that um that, that which people are convicted that that then end them up um in prison and sometimes a long prison sentence then of course begin to intersect with the border regime whereby in britain if you um since 2007 if you are um sentenced to an offense um sentenced to a um for a prison sentence that, that is more than 12 months, then you are automatically subject to deportation. Um, and so, so the way in which um, this violence kind of ends up um, actually leading to deportation, exile, and, 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 even, and even death, and of course, separation from loved ones and family members. And so I think when we're thinking about reform, there are, really, there are things that we can, you know, working within the system, um, clearly kind of make demands. And I think that now is the moment to make demands. It, um, 
you know, in the, not just in the wake of the Black Lives Matter uprising, but I think that's also connected to the to the to the moment of the pandemic, which of course we're still very much in. But I think that people are kind of seeing an opportunity for a shifting kind of politics or a different way of being. Um, and kind of making more demands and that and so of course it's it's a it's a good time to be making very clear demands like reinstating legal aid for people fighting deportation um, reinstating uh, the, um, the the human rights protections for people facing deportation etc but I think it's really important important that alongside those debates that we're aiming for a much broader abolitionist politics um, I'm being quite careful when um, I guess when we're having these discussions when we have kind of the luxury of doing a more uh, kind of long-term goal thinking around questions of um, anti-racism um, that we are being more um, radical in our demands and kind of recognizing that the longer we kind of entangle ourselves in the system of um, rights and, and, and citizenship rights that we actually um, end up making it quite difficult for uh, people who um, occupy or are made to occupy precarious statuses or, or, or um, um, uh, legal categories that, that don't come with um, prote rights protection. Of course, those people tend to be um, predominantly racialized people where even a secure category like citizenship actually becomes insecure um, if, if, if one is racialized or has a kind of potential claim to a heritage um, outside of a, a white British heritage. So I guess um, I just wanted to kind of um, indicate how our thinking around abolition and reformism kind of it, is, it's something that we always have to walk a, 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 a fine line on, that we want to be making demands at a moment that we think transformation is possible and those should be radical, um, but we also want to not lose the opportunity to, um, whilst connecting all the dots, um, really importantly between histories of empire and militarized policing and modern and more contemporary forms of racial state violence or how they manifest today that we're making kind of demands that are that will imminently help individuals within um within the system or caught within the criminal justice or immigration system um whilst also ensuring that they're framed within that broader um sort of connected dots discourse which i think you know the, the, these events that cat has been running are really doing um to make sure that the goal is always um, is always the, the the most radical goal in terms of abolition in all of these sectors, whether we're talking about immigration or, or policing or prisons.